thank you all for coming today. Uh, we have a number of new Maxwell features. Some we have been working on for well over a year. Mostly they're foundational. Uh, they're very important to us, and I hope they're important to you as well. So we've been working on the underpinnings of things, but we're proud of it. And we'll jump into this stuff. So when you have a cloud-based system like Maxwell, it's a little difficult to do big releases because you tend to do sort of small releases along the way. In a number of ways, that's a good thing. Testing is easier to do. Rolling things out in smaller chunks is easier to do. But actually gathering people together to talk about significant new features is a little harder. So we will probably do this once or twice a year as we move forward. But we don't have it on a scheduled basis. It's not the same as these monolithic release sizes that we do for other software packages. A quick catch up to what's going on in Maxwell. We have over 140 million measurements in the system now. And it is growing sort of in a hockey stick kind of way. So it's heading out very quickly, you know, of the 140, more than 40 million, in fact, or just the last year alone. But it's growing and it's doing well. We're happy with it. It's not growing out of control or on rampage. And that's okay with us as a small company wanting to manage this and do a careful job of it. That's okay. Measure watch control is the first thing we'll cover. Wireless and seamless measurements with the Barbieri SpectroPad and also mention of the Maxwell Certified Technician Program that we have underway, and a number of attendees today are part of that program. Measure Watch. Those of you who are familiar with it or have maybe using it, what we've done, uh, we launched it in December of 2010, and the idea is to use a color reference, like the Vogel Song reference, for instance, the color ref, and periodically and regularly measure your instrument. And from a Maxwell point of view, that's not particularly heavy lifting. You just add a track for that particular device, the instrument being the device, and you measure regularly, and things are cool. Uh, we've now renamed that slightly to call that Measure Watch Verify. And that service, uh, as of today, is unchanged. We still uh, spend a certain amount for it. We're, we're often selling it to the life of the instrument, which seems an easier way to administer it and everything. So that's Maxwell Measure Watch Verify. Today we're talking about measure watch control. Now, where we came from for this is in working on supporting more and more instruments into Maxwell and doing as good a job as possible of supporting the new ISO standards and whatnot for M series, M0, M1, M2, all those kinds of measurement standards. We wanted to make sure that we were going to do a good job with Maxwell of controlling that information and recording it effectively. Well, it turns out once we took a really good look at it, we realize there are a lot of components to measurement conditions that we want to keep an eye on. So we want to make sure that we value every single measurement that's taken into the system. Now the measurement conditions, and this isn't an exhaustive list necessarily, the measurement conditions that are handled through this measure watch control function uh, include the illumination filter, like I mentioned, the M-series, but also the mode that's used for scan. Are they reflective or transmissive or emissive measurements? the aperture of the instrument, scan control, meaning do you want patch by patch or strip or whatever, how many measurements per patch, if it can be controlled, all sorts of different things from how the calibration happens, what measurement source you're willing to accept, what calibration standards behind it, backing, the instrument information, et cetera, et cetera, including environmental conditions about the measurements. So there's a lot of information here, and what, it, what we realized is it was going to take a comprehensive underlying system. Not exactly a redesign of what we're doing, but a significant expansion of the function behind it. So to summarize this information, what we want is the ability to be able to specify things as an administrator, as you might be an administrator of the system. We might be able to specify as many of these as we can so that you say, this is the kind of measurement I'm willing to accept. You know, otherwise, you know, I'm, gen you know, I'm okay about this kind, but it's got to be reflective, but it's got to be this, or whatever you want. A fair amount of this honestly came out as a matter of supporting the Barbieri Spectral LFP, which is by far the most flexible instrument that we've supported so far. There are so many different controllable and non-controllable components to it, whether or not it's a transmissive or emissive, all that kind of stuff. So specifying is important. Controlling is also important. That's where the client gets involved and actually physically controls the device, sets it up for the proper kind of measurement, and then recording the right information about it so the, the paper trail is effective. And I'll get into this more. 
But as we implemented it, we realized we're rolling this out to a live system that people are using every day. So we want to make sure the defaults that we build in are smart, and they just do a best match effort. And so an inexperienced, relatively inexperienced user or even administrator setting up a system to just do some proofing, for instance, will automatically have the instrument set up the proper way. So if they load up the Grackle data set from 2006 to use as a color aim, we know those are M2 measurements. They're UV filtered. If they're using an I1 Pro 2, it's automatically configured to match up with that. And that's what we call smart defaults and best match. And we put a lot of effort in that because there's intelligent fallbacks that go into it as well. So if you're taking a measurement and trying to match Grackle, but your instrument doesn't do M2, Maybe your instrument does M1 and M0 or whatever. It will fall back intelligently to different settings to try and do a best match as much as it can and document the entire process. Again, that's the default. If you want to be strict as an administrator, you can set up much more strict things, and basically it will fail certain instruments. You know, If they have an old I1 that doesn't do M2, then, sorry, tough luck. You can't use it to take measurements for this. And that's when, as an administrator, you get a phone call that says, why can't I use my instrument? That's the kind of phone call you want. That's where you say, oh, it's you. You need to upgrade your instrument, or we will allow it for this purpose or whatever you want. But you can control it if you desire. Okay? We'll also tie all the measurements to the instrument itself in Maxwell. So that if you're ever wondering what instrument took a measurement, or if you find that an instrument might be giving you troubles, you can see all of the measurements it took regardless of where they were taken. We've also added the ability to support environment sensors. This isn't full streaming environment information at this point, but it does gather it, and it links it in with the measurement conditions. So temperature, relative humidity, barometric pressure, etc. If available from the instrument itself or via some plug-in sensors that we support, we're looking at supporting some additional sensors. Uh, these are inexpensive. I'll show them to you in a minute. They're easy to use, you know, plugging a USB device in. And uh, you can gather more information about what's going on. So let's jump into that, shall we? I'm going to sign in as one of our venerable test users, Dale Maxwell, and show you a bit about how this sort of stuff works. Now, here we have, let's go into a reference set. Now, uh, all of these features have been rolled out in the system and are live today. Part of the reason why it was so very important to have our defaults, our smart defaults, to actually be smart. Because otherwise, all sorts of things may have started happening in the system to existing users and messed stuff up. And we certainly didn't want that to happen. So you may notice in the reference set information, remember a reference set is where you gather together your metrics, your color aim, and other setting information, and you can use that across multiple tracks in the system. So if you have different proofers all proofing to the same standard, you just need to make one reference set and attach it to all those tracks for those proofers. And now there's this whole section at the bottom of a reference set called measurement conditions here. And you'll see those fields, or many of those fields I mentioned before. Now this one is particularly strict. The defaults in this particular setting have asterisks beside them so that you can see. The defaults are pretty allowing. So for instance, the light filter, the M series, is best matched to color aim. So what this does is it works alongside your color aim. If you have taken measurements using the system, then these all of these fields will have been set by the client taking the measurements. Otherwise, if it's legacy measurement information, I can go in and set up. I'll get into how to deal with legacy stuff in, the few, in, in just a moment. Um, but basically, if the light filter for your measurement set is set to uh, M2, for instance, it will work together with the reference set. So the reference set is your rules, and you can defer some of these settings to the coloring. And that, by default, again, makes life a little easier. But you can very clearly specify that maybe you only want six millimeter aperture measurements because you've got large spots from a ViewTech, for instance. Scan mode is a very good one, but certainly maybe you want all your measurements for a certain thing to be transmissive. And that will basically fail instruments that can't do transmissive. That's the idea by it. They simply won't be able to measure into it. You can set all sorts of stuff in here. 
as well as by default, it now says client direct drive only. So by default, it will only accept measurements that are directly driven by the Maxwell client. That tightens down the measurement chain. Uh, but you can open this up and say, no, it's okay. Let them use a hot folder so they can dump in measurements from wherever or let them upload from all over the place into the web interface, for instance. So these are ways where you can start to basically tighten down what's going on. Now, there's an important one down here at the bottom called measurement purpose. It will default to production testing, and in general, that's good. But what that means is all of those nice controls in the measurement window will be locked down. The idea being that your operator is using this to take measurements. You don't want them accidentally or on purpose clicking on things and changing stuff. So they'll lock down. If you want the ability to change things, then chances are good you're measuring into what we call a target bin, or you're taking a reference color measurement. These are the kinds of measurements that we take if we're doing like measurements for curve, for instance, or for profiling, or for use as a color aim in Maxwell, for instance, where you want to be able to set the instrument up using the on-screen controls and specify explicitly what's going on, and then take the measurement and all that information will be recorded. So if you find yourself, I'll, I'll probably repeat this, if you find yourself on the client and you can't control things, it might be because you're in a production measurement track, which is a normal track, and you shouldn't, or you need to attach a reference set. I have one here called, uh, what's it called, target bin ref set that I made. And I attach that to my target bin track where I measure targets and whatnot into it, and then I set them up for reference color measurement. Okay? These two basically work together to create the kind of control that we're looking for. When you get to the client, the Maxwell client, version 5 of the client is required to take advantage of all the new features that we're talking about today. In general, it looks and acts very much the same. We have rebuilt significant portions of it underneath the hood. So the way it communicates with Maxwell and the way it communicates with the local database have in some portions been completely rebuilt and are many, literally thousands of times faster. So for larger data sets and when the database gets full of information and whatnot, that should act a lot faster now. Let's jump into the measurement window so I can show you though where some of these new measurement control functions show up. You'll see at the bottom of the screen here, there are a number of new buttons here, M0 through M3, reflective, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now what I'll do is I will add a track in this case, for the target bin, this, if you have a bunch of tracks you want to add, you can add multiple tracks at once. Just keep adding them to this list. But if I go into this particular track and I say measure, depending on the instrument I select, I don't have anything uh, connected at the moment, it will enable, you see M0 and M2 are now available to me here. Again, that's because I'm taking a reference measurement and it's allowing me the control explicitly to say whether I want M0 measurements or M2 measurements. Now, I know some of you are probably saying right off the bat, hey, can I take multiple measurements at the same time into Maxwell? The answer to that is not yet. We're working on it. That's part of the reason why M0 through M3 are available here as separate buttons as opposed to a pop-up. At some point in the future, we will enable the ability for you to take M0 and M2 and M1 or whatever you want simultaneously from that instrument and feed those into Maxwell. But you can select the reflective mode and all sorts of different things across here. Also, if you're curious, it's somewhat arcane the way it's written, but you can open up this area here and it will tell you how it's making its decision making as far as the settings it's allowing for the user and also what it's selected or what the user has selected. So what the reference set specifies, what the instrument is capable of doing, what the color aim has, what's allowed, and then what's selected. So uh, if you're troubleshooting this problem, if you've selected something in Maxwell and it's failing your instrument and you're not sure why, you can go in here and follow sort of the decision making that it makes and what it decides at the bottom. We don't expect many users to open that up, but it could be used for troubleshooting just to evaluate what's going on. This window has been rebuilt in a number of different ways. So the feedback for users is better than it was in the previous version, just for you know 
line-to-line -line scanning with an I1 Pro and that sort of idea. We've also got status indicators in the upper corner here, USB, Maxwell, and Wi-Fi, as well as in the main window. So if it's busy communicating with Maxwell, if the client is, you will see activity in these. It will give you something to keep an eye on if you're wondering what might be going on. Now, a couple of things I wanted to quickly go over while we're here for those experienced Maxwell users. We have this advanced menu. It's only available when you're not in operator mode. But there are a few new things in here. One of them is setting of defaults. And this can be very handy. In the past, when you added a track to the client, it basically set auto print as printing preference. And that might not be what you want. But sometimes the tracks get added automatically, like when using an ISIS and auto scan. So now you can go in here and you can explicitly set all of these things on the left side are what will be set for any added track. So if you want all your, all your tracks to, to use the ISIS or whatever, you can set it here. But you can also, while you're in here, if you have a whole bunch of tracks in your left side, you can apply any of these to all of the current tracks. So if I want printing in all of the tracks that are here to be preview only, I just say apply to all current tracks and it's done. So it can be easy for administering the client and making the setting up of the client uh, faster and easier for you. There's also a log window, which can be fairly arcane. It has a, a number of things going by. And if you really want to see the, the detritus, just uncheck some of the filters at the bottom here. And then when you start looking around for things, you'll see it accessing the internal database. You will see it accessing Maxwell itself. You'll see it syncing to different instruments, all sorts of stuff going on. So that can be very handy for troubleshooting as well as just for, for figuring out what might be going on at any particular time. You can leave that log window open or close it. Again, it's sort of an advanced function. Let's jump back into the PowerPoint. So a few of the support points for this measure watch control function, version 5 or later of the client is required. As you can probably see, there's a lot of stuff that went on, not just in Maxwell, but actually more in the client in order to make all that decision making, gather all the right information, feed it up into Maxwell, etc. When dealing with legacy color aims to get them into this system, we will be enabling the fields for general user editing, and you'll be able to go into your color aims and specify because, you know, you may have grackle type color but it may not explicitly be set to say that it's M2, for instance. And you should go in and set those. And then the client will work together with the ref set, will work together with the coloring to kind of enforce everything and keep everything going the way we want. If you have any questions about your measurements and what settings you should make, by all means, get in touch with us. Say, well, I uploaded stuff, but I don't know what kind of aperture or whatever it might be. Uh, we can definitely get you that information and help you set up your, your legacy color aims as well. And I also mentioned the production versus reference measurements, that if you want to be able to control those features in the measurement window, the reference set that's associated with it needs to be set up for reference measurements as opposed to production measurements. So the idea behind this is that we're creating a color measurement chain of custody that really you can start explaining at any point. but. But I suppose you could say it starts at the measurement stage. You know, you're going to have your reference measurements of some sort. Uh, they may come out of an ICC profile like we do. But nonetheless, they're going to be fed into the system. They need those parameters set up to say what kind of M-series measurement they are, maybe what kind of aperture, reflective, transmissive, etc. That is the documentation you might do by hand. But if you take the measurement in the client, the, all that information is automatically documented. We will be adding reporting functionality as well so that you could pass fail or warn or whatever, depending on that kind of information. That feeds back into the specification, of course, in the reference set, and then the enforcement in the client, which creates good measurements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it creates this feedback cycle so that the measurements are what you want them to be and what you expect them to be. But again, the defaults are smart. This does not require strict work on your part if you're looking at it going, oh, it seems like it'll be useful, but you're not want, wanting to run around and stuff, it will still be working on your behalf, and it should work just fine. That's the idea behind it. It's only when you need to dig into it and start setting things explicitly will you need to get into setting these parameters in the reference set. And, and The cost? Nothing. 
It's included with everything. The measure watch verify function I spoke about, we do, we do charge for that to, uh, to keep an eye on an instrument and whatnot. But when it comes to this one, we decided it was so important to every measurement taken into Maxwell, we were just building it in. So measure watch control is part of Maxwell. It enforces everything. If it wasn't used on every track, if it required some sort of special subscription, it would lose its usefulness by a long shot. So it's included. So let's move forward. Today, we have heat map. And heat map is what we consider part of our digital press watch service. It's very useful for digital presses to do cross-sheet delta E analysis in a visual, meaningful way. So if this were your target on the left with all the scattered patches, with a digital press, we can fill the page with the target, which is a wonderful thing. With the ISIS and the ISIS-2, soon hopefully the Minolta FD9, uh, we can quickly scan that entire page. With heat map, we can give you a delta E readout, left to right, of what's going on. And this can give you a good indication of what's going on inside the press, which consumables are starting to fail what work you might need to do to fix things. We've had requests from people to break this down, and this took some engineering. So now we're introducing heat map channel analysis. It's just an upgrade to the heat map functionality. It's what we consider sort of the next level of visual diagnostics. It simply breaks down the heat map into channels, but what happens behind the scenes is not as easy as it looks. We can still use full multicolor patch targets all the way through the color space, as many different kinds of patches as possible is great. Uh, and you can keep the inking even across the target and all that sort of thing. It doesn't require any weird things for the target. It analyzes all of the patches, not just the single ink or duplicate patches. So some of these systems that are starting to do this sort of function, they require explicit duplicate patches uh, across the target. We figure that cuts down on the sampling significantly and also introduces all sorts of potential sampling problems because of inking and whatnot. This uses all of the patches and intelligently analyzes each patch to see if it's contributing to the color shift that might be seen. Let me jump out and show that to you briefly. Here's a heat map report. We've added TVI graphs to the reports. This is a horrible TVI graph. Well, that's okay because it was a horrible inkjet printer we printed it on. Well, you can see the magenta curve is particularly low, but in this particular case, the heat map is relatively unblemished. It looks okay overall. Well, farther down on the port, you'll see the channel analysis, okay? And you'll see that it has carefully analyzed and found that what little color shifts and problems there are are pretty much evenly distributed across the channels. We've looked at a number, quite a number, of in-field measured targets to test this. Uh, and then also, I had Pat Harold here, our tech support guru, uh, create some problems in targets and then send them to me. And I could see if I could figure out what might be at the root of them. So first of all, you get this one. Now that's what the heat map looks like today. What channel's causing the problem? Well, see the intelligent channel analysis breaks it down so you can see pretty clearly it's the magenta channel where this problem is residing. And again, these are not just magenta patches. Now, these patches, of course, if they're going to appear in the magenta channel breakdown, they will contain magenta ink. But there's a fair amount more analysis that goes in to determine if it believes that the magenta channel is contributing significantly to the error. That's really what's at the basis of it. And then it intelligently pulls out these patches so that you can visually, again, just like the heat map, it's a very quick visual indicator of what's going on you can tell right away, or your operator can tell right away, minimum of training, what unit might be starting to have problems. So same thing, cyan, yellow. Uh, every test that Pat sent me, I was able to quickly diagnose which channel it resided in, or if it didn't reside in any one particular channel, then the errors just evenly distributed across all of them, which is also another kind of indicator. So that's the upgrade to the heat map function. Today, that is only available in the client. It's not available at the max of the web level yet. We will be adding it to Maxwell proper soon. So the next topic, wireless measurements. Quick review, this digital press watch thing we've talked about, we take full advantage of the ISIS. We really like the ISIS as an instrument. The fact that it does barcoded measurements and that you can do a full target 
read in a relatively short period of time is something we really like. We can do these heat maps, we can do a lot of data gathering, and using the barcode, we can automatically route measurements from whatever press and whatever paper in your room to the correct track, the correct target information, and all that in Maxwell. One of the areas we're putting a lot of effort into supporting is wide and grand format inkjet. Now, the ISIS is good in there, but what we found is that the Barbieri SpectroPad is a great instrument for this purpose. When we sat down to support this device, we really wanted to take full advantage of what it is. If you're not familiar with it, it's a relatively small, I'm not sure I call it handheld, but it's very portable as you can see. And I have one here I'll demonstrate quickly for you. You can connect it via Wi-Fi, which is a wonderful capability, which means uh, even better than Bluetooth. It can be used almost anywhere in your organization as long as you have a Wi-Fi network available. Bluetooth is only within spitting distance of the computer that's trying to connect to it. There's Wi-Fi anywhere in your facility. You can also do a USB direct connect if you want. It has on-device pass-fail reporting. So on the device itself, you get a pass-fail, you get the metrics, you can go to work. And you can take these measurements completely untethered. So you don't need to be in your facility. You can leave your facility entirely, go to a customer site or a partner site, take measurements, get pass-fail, come back, and as soon as Maxwell sees that device, it'll harvest all those measurements. So we spent a lot of time taking everything that's in Maxwell, from the color aim to the metrics and their tolerances, all that sort of information, and forming it so that it's automatically copied across to the SpectroPad over Wi-Fi or USB, just bang, automatic. And then it pulls the device regularly to harvest any measurements that show up. It'll do additional reporting in the client if you want, in the Maxwell client. So if you really want a label to be printed, it can also print a label because the measurements go into the client, the label comes out, off you go. And then it's fed right into a track in Maxwell, just like other measurements. So all the reporting and notifications and all that kind of information work. Also, because of the new architecture we have in the measure watch control that I referred to, all of those capabilities in Maxwell, you know, whether you want M0, M1, M2, and this instrument will take all three of them, you set those at the track level in Maxwell on the website, and that will translate all the way down into the device and make sure that that's the measurement you get, and then document it as it loads it back up. So we really fully and seamlessly support this device. It's a great little unit. So oh, let's take a look at it. So here's the instrument here on my desk, okay? It's got a battery in it. It has a, a certain amount of flash memory. It's got a touch-capable screen here. And the idea here is that this head just slides back and forth. If you haven't seen this before, these silver components are aluminum. So some people say, you want me to run around in my busy production environment? with one of these, what if I drop it? And it's like, I haven't dropped one of these, but quite frankly, I think it might do okay dropping it. This is a pretty tough little device. But again, it has a touch screen, it's got the battery, you go into settings, you go into Wi-Fi, and you can set up your Wi-Fi information. There's two different ways of doing Wi-Fi. There's the conventional manner here on the left, which is where it hooks up to a Wi-Fi network, the typical kind of way of doing it, and you use the little on-screen keyboard and put in your password and whatnot. But also, it will become a Wi-Fi hotspot of sorts. So if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you want to talk to this, just you and your computer, it will become a Wi-Fi hub, basically. It doesn't connect to the internet, so don't get the wrong idea. But it becomes a little Wi-Fi hub. Your computer will see it. You can connect to it that way. But Maxwell information needs to be set up before that will all you know, work from our perspective. There's some controls along the top here. That, like, for instance, the little audio thing there is actually a control button. You can turn audio on or off using it. So um, setup is pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of function on the device itself. In order to take advantage of our functionality today in Maxwell, you need the DOC function, which is an optional function when you buy this particular device. So if you're considering buying one of these, it can be upgraded in the field if you need. But talk to us first if you haven't purchased one yet and you're wondering if it'll work. But ours works with the off-the-shelf SpectroPad without a problem. And we use this digital output control. Now, let me quickly go into the client 
So I can show you how this is administered because it's actually remarkably straightforward. I go into a track that's already added in my client. There's a new field here called SpectroPad AutoSync. Okay? I check the box. And then I tell it what target I want. And I'm going to use the short test target. Okay? And that's pretty much it, believe it or not. Now, the next time it's synchronized across, it will use all of the metrics that it's able to. It will transfer all that information across onto the SpectroPad and make it available for you to take measurements. So how do you connect to the SpectroPad? Well, you may see here that it's already appeared and connected via Wi-Fi. There's a setup in the advanced menu. It's pretty straightforward. You just go into set SpectroPad IP address, and that screen I showed you earlier for Wi-Fi will tell you what IP address the device has. We're working on making that process more automatic, but for now, it's similar to how you do it in the Barbieri software. You key in the IP address of the SpectroPad you want to connect to, and then you check Pole Network for SpectroPad, and it will constantly look for the SpectroPad. And you can have that SpectroPad asleep in the corner, shut off, plugged in, charging. Sometime in the day, someone comes in, wants to take a measurement. They just go in. They'll turn the instrument on. They'll hit this digital output thing here. You can see here there's now MXE9000, which is our device, and test track is the name of the track. So the track name appears here just like it appears in the client. So whatever terminology you use is familiar. You know. So I'm going to set the scanning head to the left. I'm going to select that particular job. It wants me to measure the line. There's a little speedometer kind of thing that you can see that tells me if I'm going too fast or too slow or whatever. As soon as I've measured the last line of the target, it basically gives me the on-screen summary and the pass-fail indication of what's going on. And these are horrible numbers, but that's OK in this particular case. But these metrics, the metric name, the tolerance information, and the values and, and the check marks and the X's are very similar to what you see in Maxwell. So Maxwell's really effectively moved directly across onto this device. If you have more than one page of metrics, it will allow that. And then also, after the metrics, you can page through this report is what I'm saying. After the metrics, it will summarize information. If you want to double check like the last time it was synced, which reference set is in use, which color aim, et cetera. You can also page down through the measurements, each patch itself, and find out that kind of stuff. But the measurements are not actually saved to the device, it turns out, until you click Close. Then they're saved. The client is actually canvassing this SpectroPad every 60 seconds to see if any new measurements have shown up. So it just happens automatically. The reason we're doing it so rapidly is in normal use, you can see there's a little windy thing that showed there, a little circular activity monitor that showed up there. The use pattern we expect for this is someone will take a measurement, they'll get their pass fail, and then they'll probably turn it off fairly quickly. And so we want to harvest those measurements as soon as we can and pull them off, as well as new, new information that needs to be synced onto it as, as quickly as possible. I have a question about how are multiple tracks handled on the SpectroPad. They just show up as different jobs. So for instance, if I go into this, uh, oh, so there's the new report. Okay, so up it fired. So so it just harvested these measurements directly off the SpectroPad in the client. I have the client set to preview as it's printing. And so we'll get the same results in here. But other metrics, like standard deviation, for instance, that are not available on the SpectroPad, not all Maxwell metrics are available on the SpectroPad, they will be evaluated in the client. So there is the possibility, if you have a tolerance, now I don't have a tolerance for standard deviation, but if I had a tolerance of like, six or something for standard deviation, and all of the other metrics passed, it is possible that a job could pass on the SpectroPad but fail in the client because of the additional metrics evaluated. So it's worth keeping an eye on. We were concerned about this at first, and then we decided, oh, we should just teach people about that because the advantage of having additional measurements or additional metrics evaluated in the client is actually pretty good. That's a nice thing to have. And whether or not you want it to fail, you just set tolerances specifically for that. So let me hide that. Now, if I wanted other tracks to sync across, I can just go to this other track, for instance, and I can say, auto sync this track. And I'm going to use the short test target again. And hopefully everything will match up. Now, another important support requirement here, and there's a few, I have a slide about this, is that the target that's used here has to have 
all the same patches or all of, all of the patches on this target must be available in the color aim or it will not sync across. It's not as flexible as Maxwell that way. There's another question about the way this will happen, the way this will sync across, assuming it successfully syncs, is after the next sync. I can manually sync as well. I should have mentioned that. I can just click sync specifically. And you can see the, the Wi-Fi activity when, when talking to the SpectroPad and the Maxwell activity when talking to Maxwell, USB and whatnot here. So uh, it, it can be quite handy to get a feeling for what sort of thing is going on. Uh, how many tracks can be stored on the device? We have not tested it at the upper end, so we don't know yet. We have not been explicitly told that there is a limit. Um, that's something I would like to test. We just haven't really had the time to throw hundreds of tracks at it. There is a file structure on the SpectroPad, and there are all these little files that need to be created on the, on the desktop side and then transferred over. And so there isn't really an explicit limitation in that either. But some of the limitations about the SpectroPad honestly haven't been published. Like, for instance, what's the storage capacity of it? I'm less concerned about how many tracks can go on it and more concerned about how many measurements can be taken. But as long as it's set up to sync regularly and auto-sync over Wi-Fi, the idea behind this is that I can just turn this SpectroPad on and off as I need. It will be updated practically instantly when I turn it on. So any changes, even at the web level, will translate all the way down into the instrument and make sure that the right type of measurement is taken. There's chest track two. It has appeared on the device automatically just as a matter of the auto sync that goes on. And I can select it and I can take the measurement. Again, I selected the same target. Single line target is obviously kind of rare for this sort of thing, but nonetheless, it's very easy for demo purposes. <laughs> so uh, this one in particular passed. So now you can see what one looks like when it passes. Also, I should mention that when you take a measurement, you can see, let's do that again. You can see right up here at the top that it's set for M0. So if the track had specified or the color aim had been set to M1 or M2, that would appear right there. So that measure watch control function is rolling all the way down into this instrument, but it does it for the i1 Pro, for the IO, for the ISIS, and it will do it for the LFP. Uh, the idea is that control function goes to all of the devices. Again, I'll take a quick measurement. You can measure pretty quickly. It's nice. They say there's supposed to be a delta E requirement, and I put some black felt pen marks between these patches. But it turns out I've actually measured this target quite quickly, and these two cyan patches are almost identical. It seems to handle it. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a little more forgiving than the i1 Pro, for instance, when doing that. But that's that. Those measurements are saved. You can see right away it's starting to sync. And those measurements are going to be pulled over to the client and then fired right back up into Maxwell. It just, the SpectroPad suddenly becomes part of the cloud. Now before we jump out of here, I wanted to show you, oh, here's some more reports coming in. If those were labels, the, the label printer would just spit them out. Here's a temperature sensor. Uh, I believe this thing is uh, 39.95 or something like that, right? USB on one end, temperature probe on the other. This is actually meant for educational purposes, but truly it's good for our purposes as well. Not difficult to use. You just plug it in, right? Here's another one. This requires a bit of an, an adapter that they also sell. We can get you this information. And this one is for uh, barometric pressure, okay? And then also we have one for humidity, okay? Now all you need to do to support these kinds of functions is, is plug them in. So I'll bring the client to the front, and I'm going to plug the, the barometer into one of my USB ports. And I'm going to plug my temperature sensor into the other USB port. And that's all you need to do. And that's all you should do. You shouldn't even click to, to, to uh, connect to them. But you can see over here on the left under environment sensors, the barometer has already been connected to. And within a little tick, it will take its first set of measurements from it. There we are. We're at 100 kilopascals. Uh, also, the temperature sensor will do the same thing. Once you plug these things in, the client just periodically samples them. I don't have all the connections for the humidity as well. But I wanted to show you something. That this particular device, if I go in under info for this device, this little I here, you'll note it has the uh, serial number and whatnot. The SpectroPad also records temperature and relative humidity. And it records that at the time of measuring. Okay, The, the time on the device is synchronized 
when it does a sync with your computer. So there are really very few settings you make on this device. So I'll take one more measurement, and then we'll return to that in a sec. We'll get our unhappy report, and we'll save it. Okay? Let's jump back to the presentation so we can wrap up with a few additional slides. Sorry, there was a question here I may have missed. So you can take multiple measurements, and they automatically sync back to Maxwell using Wi-Fi or USB. That's correct. That's correct. Those measurements I took, I could, be, I could be on the other side of the world, quite honestly, as long as the client software can see the SpectroPad across the network. So if your corporation allows for that, then that SpectroPad can be anywhere. But, but also, what's cool about it, I think, is that if it is set up, if the tracks all synced over to the SpectroPad, you could be completely offline. You could go to a client site or a print partner site or wherever, and you could take measurements, you could get pass-fail, you could discuss, you could evaluate, you could do whatever you're going to do out there. You come back as soon as the client that's running in your facility sees that thing on Wi-Fi, it'll harvest all those measurements. So you get the benefit of complete offline and full cloud connectivity. Uh, this Maxwell Certified Technicians, we just wanted to mention that we've, we've been adding to the bevy of people who know about Maxwell as customers, but also as trusted industry people. They've attended Chromex training. They've proven proficiency. They've had to configure stuff in the system and show us that they know how the bits and pieces work. And they are now available to us and ultimately to you if you want as a consulting force to install it, to help train on it, to troubleshoot a client that's in a different city than you, but you want them to use it, or a print partner that's in a different city than you, but you want them to use it. It can make your life a lot easier. So we're happy to add a boatload of people to this list. I think we have 12 so far, which in our little color world is actually quite a few. And we appreciate the efforts they put into this, and we will work to keep them up to date on everything going on in Maxwell. We tend to have a fairly short line for tech support. Whoever wants to call us can, but, but we do keep these people close and informed. It's another resource that you can draw on. By all means, contact us if you're looking for someone to help you. Of course, we do it as much as we can here and in person. But now we have a, a bunch of people in the field who can help with it. So coming attractions. These will likely show up in version 5.1 of the client. So I.O. memory scan. If you use an I1 I.O. or you're thinking about it, what we've done with the I.O. is we've made it so that if you put a target in the same position on the bed every time, and if you have like a, a proofing target that's in the corner of your proof, and it's always in the same corner of the proof, you put a couple pieces of heavy tape on the I.O. table so that you can line the page up easily to the same position and hit the static hold down button. Then what you can do with memory scan is the first time you say add to memory and you set the three corners of that particular target to be scanned on the I.O. From then on out, all you need to do is hit memory recall. And you can put a new target on the table, position the same thing, hit memory recall, bang, it measures it. This could save hours and hours of time over the long run. People taking I1 Pro measurements of proofs, cutting them down, maybe unnecessarily, if they can fit, kind of hanging on to the table. The whole process could save, I think it'll definitely pay for the price of an I.O. if you're taking a lot of measurements with the I1 Pro. So that's already in there and working. We just need to troubleshoot the user interface a little bit, but that's coming. We're interested in feedback about that, people who might use it, people who want to beta test it with us. Because if you have an I.O., this, we, I put it in there just for testing with the I.O. Because it made life so much easier. I could just drop a target on the I.O. and hit a button and it scanned it. It made it practically as easy as like the ISIS, which is a nice thing. So other coming attractions, automatic instrument registration. Every instrument plugged into the client will automatically be registered, and it will create a record in Maxwell for that device using the serial number. That will aid us as we move forward in tying all the measurements together with the instrument, but also it will aid us in just making sure that all the instruments are tracked and it's just automatically handled. And if you have, like, MeasureWatch Verify service set up for the device, that will be automatically configured as well. So it'll say, oh, I know this instrument. Oh, hang on, you need to take a, a verification measurement, that kind of idea. So that's coming. 
the Barbieri Spectro, the LFP table that we like a lot. Really, the first decent spectro scan replacement with all of its glory, the multiple apertures and all that being supported by measure watch control again. Uh, Multi-page targets will be supported in version 5.1. We haven't done that so far. For instance, if you want to do a heat map across the full width of the Indigo 10,000, you're not going to stuff one of those targets into an ISIS. It needs to be a multi-page target. So we'll be supporting multi-page target. We will also have the ability to do reference set duplication at the Maxwell level. So we're going to be building fully qualified reference sets as standard in the system for you know ISO, PSO, ID Alliance, everything. So you don't need to build them yourself with all the right metrics and whatnot. You can use those, it's no problem. But if you want to alter them, all you do is do a quick duplication of it so you don't have to set one up. And then as some of our uh, Maxwell technicians like to do, you can tighten up the tolerances in certain areas, whatnot. But it'll make it easier to set that sort of thing up. Also, we'll be supporting all of the metrics within Maxwell that are required for those. So, from all of us on this Maxwell side of things at uh, Chromix, myself, Rick Hatmaker, and Pat Harrell, thank you for being Maxwell customers and technicians, and also for just showing your interest. As you can see, it's growing. A number of these new features are really foundational, as, as, as I showed, um, but they will help us quickly uh, and effectively support new instruments as we go forward, as well as the kind of control and f flexibility we know that you guys need in the field. So, are we done? All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys.